Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm your host, Scott Wheeler. Today's guest is an author who is here to talk about his latest book, Stephen Payne. Welcome to the show. Well, good morning. Thanks, Scott. Nice and to be here. How many books have you written? Let's see. I have, this is my sixth book. Right. And uh, five are still available in publication. And your latest one is You Were Always There. And that's actually based um, based in Greensboro? It is. Yeah, this book is a coming-of-age love story that uh, is set um, in the 1970s uh, around uh, Caspian Lake in Greensboro. And it's the story of a kind of ne'er-do-well farm uh, boy who's just graduated from college and is awaiting his draft induction notice in 1970 during Vietnam. And he's working for the local sawmill delivering post and beam. And one Saturday, he gets a job to take a load down to a fancy new house being uh, built on the lake. And when he arrives, there's a beautiful blonde girl sitting cross-legged on the warm hood of a 67 Mustang convertible, cherry red. And uh, he meets Sarah, who is the daughter of a powerful federal judge who is uh, building this house. And uh, both of their lives change forever, shall we say. So I don't know if you want to tell me or not, but I think of another judge that had ties to that town. Uh, maybe some people don't realize it is uh, the late uh, Judge uh, Justice um, Rehnquist. Rehnquist. It, is that based on him? It really isn't based on him at all, though Greensboro and Craspian, uh, the Lake Caspian Lake there has had so many famous writers, judges, all kinds of professors that have had camps there over the years, including Judge Rehnquist many years ago. And um, so it's not really, it doesn't have anything to do with Kim, but it's coincidental that he had a camp, and I think his family still has a camp on the lake. Now, what is your uh, connection to that region, or do you have one? Well, I grew up in St. Johnsbury with a farm in Irisburg, so this neck of the woods was, um, you know, an area that I was very familiar with. And during college, <laughs> My summer job was I was a deputy sheriff for Caledonia County. And um, one of our patrol areas was the Hardwick area and Coles Pond Casino right. and uh, up in Sutton. I worked at Cedar Grove Dance Hall, a lot of the Northeast Kingdom haunts. And we used to patrol uh, up around Greensboro to help out the Orleans County Sheriff. And so I really became familiar with that area and just loved it. It's such a beautiful area as, as this whole area is. So when I started writing um, stories about Vermont, you know, I just naturally wrote about the Northeast Kingdom and that central northern part. And um, so it's kind of been in my blood right. from the beginning. Right. Yeah, my, my mother's... Uh, through my mother, my ancestral ties are in Irisburg, and uh, so that's that's good to hear. And uh, I always stop in at the uh, at Bob's Quick Stop. I um, I always call him the mayor, <laughs> just because he knows everything that's going on in town. Um, so um, so I I guess word got out that writers are very wealthy people, <laughs> and. Uh, and in, uh, with a big knot, it's let, let's be real. You didn't get into money uh, writing for the money of it, but, but you apparently because in your other life you are a retired surgeon. Correct. I I assume you're probably after you retired from being a surgeon, it wasn't a pay increase to become a writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely true. 
I actually donate proceeds from my books to different organizations. Um, I had two novels come out, uh, both set in Maine, on the coast of Maine, Cliff Walking, which actually won an international award. Right. And the sequel to it, Life on a Cliff. And I worked with Prevent Child Abuse Vermont for many years, raising money for them um, with those books. And then uh, Riding My Guitar, the Rick Norcross story, story of a wonderful Vermont musician from East Hardwick. I raised money for uh, the Lake Champlain Land Trust, uh, which I'm on the board of. So I, that's really the financial part of writing for me is being able to donate money to worthy causes. Now, I've got to tie your, your medical in because in, in a way they're very different. Being a surgeon, that's kind of like nuts and bolts stuff as in very scientific you have to go in there and there's you can't just say well you know i guess i'm going to do it this way <laughs> uh but the thing is with right your writing it's almost like a totally different way of thinking because you're going from science to fiction why how, how did that come about well i've been writing i wrote my first book in sixth grade called Skybound. It was about World War II paratroopers right. that my dad used to talk about. And in seventh grade, um, I met Galway Cannell, yeah. who lived in Sheffield. And he came to speak to our English class. And I remember listening to him talk about the feeling of needing to write. And even at that young age, I really, I had the bug about writing. So I've kind of had parallel careers, if you will, my whole life. I went to Tufts University in Boston, majored in English and biology pre-med, and kind of went back and forth between the two. And so I've really been writing longer than I was in medicine, though I, I practiced medicine for about 40 years. So I, I guess, as they say, both parts of my brain work because <laughs> I've always had the creative side going. Though, interestingly, you know, when I was doing surgery, I had to completely focus on that. Like, I'm very compartmentalized. Right. You know, when I'm writing, I'm really in that head space. And when I was doing surgery, or I teach at the medical school in Burlington part time, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of another silo I'm in. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've been fortunate that I've been able to kind of do both things pretty much my whole life. So you weren't, so in other words, you weren't, um, you weren't doing a surgery or doing a colon screen and, and thinking about the next plot line at the same time. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, really separate parts of my life. Right. Um, is there either one that you find more fulfilling? Or is it just fulfilling in different ways? Yeah, I think it's the latter. They're really fulfilling in different ways. Um, you know, writing both fiction and nonfiction has been a lot of fun. Um, I wrote for Vermont Life for about 10 years for Tom Slayton, who was a wonderful editor back then. And I really enjoyed writing all kinds of articles, whether it was the groomers up on Smuggler's Notch or the Johnson Woolen Mills, et cetera. And it was really through that that I met Howard Mosier down here in Irishburg, who became a wonderful friend and a tremendous mentor. Howard, uh, when he was alive, I think he read almost everything I wrote <laughs> in early drafts and was very, very helpful, you know, teaching me a lot. And in fact, Phyllis, his wonderful widow, uh, was one of my first readers for this latest novel right. and, and was very helpful in kind of bringing the story into focus. So I don't know, both both parts of my life have been very fulfilling, but I'm, I'm happy to leave the clinical surgery in the rear view. Right. Um, you know, it's funny, I don't know where Howard find t found time to write because he was helping people like my my wife uh, their her parents at one time used to babysit Annie oh. and 
Annie and Jake. Jake. Yeah. And um, so, you know, her family goes back with Howard, and Howard would read my work. So I don't know where he found time to write, but he did things the old-fashioned way, though. He longhand. Yes, and um, you know my problem is is I don't know if I don't know if it's true that all doctors have bad handwriting, but that's the joke. Pretty true. And uh, <laughs> my handwriting's so bad if I don't transcribe my notes really quick. Sometimes I don't know what I wrote, so <laughs> I I try not. No, I could never do a book that way. I can relate to that. <clears throat> Howard and I wrote letters back and forth probably for 25 years, and he always wrote me longhand letters on big yellow sheets of legal pad. Yeah. And, um, but he was incredibly generous. I mean, he, he helped and mentored so many um, writers and, you know, would read and, and um, endorse books when he felt it, they deserved it sort of thing. But... Chris Bojalian said to me once, he does, same thing you just said. He said, I don't know how Howard's ever had time to write a book because he's so generous with his time to other people. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, Annie's, um, Annie's also been on my show when I was uh, in Nashville for a few days. Oh, I, cool. I, can, I hooked up with her, and we did our, we did our um, interview right at the uh, – okay, I forget the – the name of the, the Grand Bluebird? No, it was Cafe. no, it was there was a Grand Resort down here. Oh, just, okay. it, it, oh the Gaylord. Yeah. And um, yeah. and so we hooked up there, and I interviewed her right, right there. So she's a really good folk singer. Yeah, yeah, she is. Yeah. yeah, but she does play at the, perform at the Bluebird too. Um, it seems like everybody in my life are great singers. It's like, um, it's. Um, like Kelby, she's the producer. She's like Madonna. She's like um, Cher. You know, just somebody has to have one name. Right. Todd Pronto, the producer of the, uh, not the producer, but he's the uh, head of the uh, NEK TV. He's a, he's a well-known singer. Me, I could clear out a room if I sang <laughs> and make your ears bleed. <laughs> Are you a singer? No. No. So, uh, what is what are your next projects you're working on? Well, I'm still doing. I toured with this new book. You were always there um, all during the fall and into the early winter, and I'm doing um, book events now with reading groups, libraries, all sorts of things. And I'll be touring um, some of the East Coast this summer with this book. Um, but I'm also on chapter. 22 of a new novel that is set down in Addison County, uh, Vermont, um, set in 1976. The, the working title is The Skater, and um, it's unrelated to my other novels, but it's, I think, going to be quite a, quite a story. But So I'm probably halfway through that new book, um, and... As I was saying earlier, I've been helping edit um, Jonathan Edwards, the folk singer's um, memoir, who's a dear friend of mine. And a friend of Todd's. And a friend of Todd's, I know. It's, <laughs> it's a tiny world. Right. So I kind of have a number of projects going. Plus, you know, I've got a pretty healthy honeydew list now that I'm retired. And we live on a farm, and uh, I'm pretty busy there, too. So... You know, uh, at one chapter of my life, well, pre-COVID, I did a lot of public speaking. I did a lot of setting up, and I, I, you know, I salute you for for doing that because, you know, that take there's there's more time to it than meets the eye because there's preparation, there's travel, there's going to it, and. And I'm not saying I'll never return to that lifestyle. Um, in in most ways, it's a necessary evil. But I do have my own way of marketing too. But there's a lot to uh, you know going cool. and setting up. And and then you sometimes you'll go. There will be 75 people there, and then sometime there's you, five. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you know I would prefer the 75. Sure. Because you get a little more enthusiastic than sitting down here looking at your wife sitting there and, <laughs> and uh, a couple other people. 
I, I've been fortunate in that uh, I've had a huge amount of support yes. from bookstores. Yes. Um, Phoenix Bookstores in Burlington, and they have they have other stores. Um, were was really where I started back when my first novel came out, and. You know, I've toured with lots of different bookstores all up through Maine with Sherman's, um, Maine Coast bookstores, and lots of other places in between. And I think as you have more and more books come out, the people who've read your previous books, the readers come out when you have a new book, so you gather this audience. And um, I really love it. I mean, writing a book is a pretty solitary enterprise. You know, I'm basically at my writing desk alone for months and months and months. So it's so much fun to come out and meet with readers and meet with the public and discuss the books or whatever else right. they want to talk about. Um, so I love touring. I mean, it's great. I, I think, you know, at some point I'll probably return to it, but I felt COVID really provided me a much needed break but then as you know but then during COVID then my wife got sick and she died so so all that happened at once and I sure. haven't built up I haven't built up the enthusiasm to to return because it's really important and I like uh, another writer friend of mine and you probably know of her is Tanya Souza yeah, uh, yeah. she goes and I always say Tanya I said I I'm so envious of you that you can go out and every talk is like you're doing it for the very first time. And I mean that in a good way, like yeah. the enthusiasm. Yeah. So. Well, it's, I just find, you know, meeting and talking to readers and other people just kind of fascinating. I, when this book came out, I um, went to the Greensboro Library and did a, did a little benefit night there. and. They were expecting, I think, eight or nine people kind of thing. Now, of course, the book is set there. Right. And when I got to the library, I could hardly get in the door. It was just jammed with people. And it was a blast. I mean, you know, a lot of people knew many of the locations that are in the book and not the fictional characters, but people like the fictional characters. I mean, it was a great time. And, you know, nights like that are just really fun. Now, did you base any of your fictional characters on real people? or can Not directly. I, I think, probably like you, I, I love to observe oh, yeah. people. You know, I'm always doing that. Right. So, I would say that my characters, many of them are like an amalgamation of lots of different people that I've met or I grew up with or whatever. But nobody in the book um, is truly, you know, based on a real person. I, I have, with permission, used real people. For instance, the great um, folk singer David Mallet appears in the sequel, Life on a Cliff, um, with, with his band, with permission. And Dave Rowell, who's a bass player in Rick and the Ramblers from East Craftsbury, he and his barn appear right. in this new novel. So, you know, once in a while I'll use a real person with their permission, but all of my characters are really made up. You see, Howard uh, Mosier told me a lot of people think they know who he's writing about. He said some he is, like a uh, stranger in the kingdom. There's, there's some of those characters that are so obvious, just <laughs> different names. But on the other hand, he said a lot of times what he did was he actually, he said some of them were completely made up, but then other times he took like two different people, three different people, morphed them together. Right. And, uh, but, um, yeah, so. Uh, and sometimes you're kind of struck with a character in, um, in Life on a Cliff novel, we, my family and I were down in Key West, Florida during school vacation one time. Right. And I was sitting on a bench downtown. The kids and my wife were in some store. And this really tough looking young woman walked by in like combat boots and she had purple hair and 
And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm going to use her. She's going to be a character in something. I didn't know what. And quite a few years later, she ended up, you know, a character in this book. I have no idea who she was. <laughs> I, yeah, that would be it. Yeah, what's the odds of her, her picking up your book and saying, I wonder. Pretty now, low, probably. I know. <laughs> so um, with, uh, with our time actually, uh, you know, getting a little bit shorter is uh, uh, where can people buy your books? Well, they're available through any bookstore anywhere. Okay. They're also available, you know, online through Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any online. And they're also on Kindle and Nook and, you know, that sort of thing. I always encourage people to buy them, you know, locally through bookstores. But the reality is today people buy tons of books or, um, you know, e-books through the internet. So you, you can get them anywhere. You can go to my website, which is stephenrussellpain.com, and, you know, there's links to the books or it tells you where to get them and more about me and the books. Now, how do you, uh, how do you, do you use the same publisher? Do you use different publishers? Do you self-publish or? I've done it all independently through Cedar Ledge Publishing, okay. and the books are all produced and distributed through Ingram, which is the biggest book distributor, really the, the only main book distributor now. So they're all available to any outlet through Ingram, like pretty much any big publisher. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have a great team. My content editor is in Fresno, California. My wonderful book designer who did this la last book with me, Carrie Cook, um, lives in Hyde Park. I mean, I, I kind of have this team, you know, around different areas. And um, I've got some great first readers. Actually, my wife is my first reader, and she is excellent. She's, we kind of put our marriage over here on the side. And um, she's just been a super first reader. And I have um, several other people, uh, you know, that read for me also. Yeah, because you know, having a spouse read, you you do need a, you do need to have that relationship where you, it is where she feels totally comfortable, maybe, uh, saying no. Because I used to tell my wife, my wife wasn't the great, the greatest reader for me because, I because I used to tell her. When she said, "Oh, this is good," that meant. So so. Yeah, so so. <laughs> and this is really good. Well, that's good. And I used to it because she really did not want to. Right. Uh, and so you've got to have a relationship because, because uh, in, like a lot of non-writers don't understand, writers are not always the best editors either. And your editors, like, because if you read an, if you read an article that you've written or a book that you've written so many times, your eyes start just glossing over. Absolutely. Because the, you know, like, because you know that the is supposed to be there, so you just like, it's like, I, I, I'm gonna tell you, my editor, my long-term editor, Janine Young of Glover, you know, she's in her 70s, and she does it to keep her, she's retired, we both work at the Chronicle, she does it to keep her mind sure. elastic. And the things that she can find, it's like, wow. Uh, she makes me look good. I'll tell you a quick, a quick little funny story. My, my editor, Leslie Kellis Payne, same name but no relation out in Fresno. Yeah. I can't remember which novel it was, but she was reading a bunch of chapters and wrote me an email one night and she said, you need to look at page whatever. And I'd been up writing at like two in the morning, really tired. I should have just gone to bed. And somehow I wrote a character from one of my Vermont short stories into this novel set in Maine that had n no connection. <laughs> <laughs> and I somehow I just thought it was a good idea that Reverend Cummings showed up in this. You know, we got to laughing and, and I'd read it over a couple of times and it made sense to me. <laughs> Oh yeah, no. Uh, 
um, it's like my daughter, who's a uh, very much a reader, is she said realistically, there she has never really read a book that did not have one little glitch in it. Because and you know the funny thing about air is whether you're writing an article or a book, you and your whole team can go over it. You don't see it. You don't see it, and then. The, you crack open the book when it comes, and it's just like in that era, is in neon, <laughs> like just glaring right out. And yeah. there's, um, but. Um, well, they say, you know, there's never been a book published that didn't have a typo. Right. And I think that's probably true. Well, the good thing between your two professions is if you make an error in a book, a typo, eh, you can live with it. Uh, you make an error as a surgeon, you get sued. Uh, so uh, very different worlds. Yeah, and uh, so uh, um, so uh, anything more about your your writing? Or? No, I mean I I appreciate being able to talk with you, and I look forward to doing uh, a lot more book events with this new book. And if there's anybody in your audience that has a book group or a reading group or a library group that is interested in reading any of my books, I'd love to come visit, you know, for discussion sessions, and I do that a lot, and it, it's a lot of fun. I think I think this year things will start coming back to life yeah. because the last, uh, you know, during COVID, a lot of, as you know, especially as a doctor, things came uh, to a halt, and because uh, I haven't, I used to be asked all the time to speak, and and I just don't think there's as many groups up and well up that's and true and a lot of the bookstores that were doing live events yeah. still haven't opened them up again right. some have right. but I think it's going to be a gradual process but people are definitely feeling much freer and safer <coughs> no, you know coming out now right um, so how many do when you write what uh, do you sit right down and write for like hours? Because like I, I, if I recall right, Howard Mosier told me he's very, he was very regimented in his work. Are you regimented or? Somewhat. I, I write or edit or do something related to writing every day, usually first thing in the morning. If I'm working on a new project and it's kind of cooking along, sometimes I can work on it for hours. Yeah. But I'm more of a work on it for a couple of hours, go out and cut some firewood and come back in and, yeah. you know, go back Absolutely. to it. I, I'm more, I'm not as regimented as Howard. And, of course, up until last year, I was doing surgery full time. So I really had to write around my surgery schedule. But now I don't have any excuses. No, no, I, I'm more like you, which I sometimes find a bit frustrating, but, um, but then, then those things that happen in the middle of the night, you, you know, you, you're trying, you go to bed trying to figure out how to word something, and then in the middle of the night, it, when you're sleeping, it pops right into your head. Have you ever had that? Happen? Oh, many times, and if I don't write it down... Oh. It's gone. Gone by morning. Can't you remember were... anything in the morning. Oh yeah. So no. I have a pad next to my bed because I I've had the exact same thing happen. You figure something out, and it makes perfect sense. But if you don't write it down, forget it. Yeah. And that's that's uh, the same way. You're speeding down the road, and all of a sudden I'm looking for a pen, and yep. and can something. Okay, well, we have got to wrap this up, and it was great having you on. And uh, um, you know, good luck. I I know uh, I know you're going to be right up there with Stephen Stephen King. You know, one of the <laughs> one of the very few people who actually do actually make a living off of writing. Even though, hey, more I've never read his work because that's not my genre. But he must be good because he's doing well. Very well. So. Very well, thanks so much for having me on. And thanks for coming on. All right. And thanks to the viewers for tuning in to another segment of the Northeast Kingdom Voice.